Okay, does anybody have any questions before we start? Yesterday, we got rolling on market structures, and tried to imagine a spectrum of competition, well more than imagine it, I guess we kind of drew, where we basically have perfect competition and no competition at each end of the spectrum, which through these three characteristics, we can kind of think about how the real world lies in between. So what were those three characteristics of perfect competition? That was the left side of the spectrum. Basically, there was three elements that uh, made a perfectly competitive market. So make sure to clear the phones off the desk. Kennedy, I just reminded myself, I just shut mine off. What was the three things? I um, a large number of sellers. Okay, a whole bunch of sellers. Homogeneous goods. Homogeneous goods, and then I see Jay back there wanting to chime in. Uh, free entry and exit. Free entry and exit. So we got a whole bunch of people selling identical stuff, and it's easy for new people to start doing the exact same thing or for the existing people to leave, right? So just kind of this easy, I want to start up a business. Boom, you're starting up a business, right? It's like instant in, instant out. <clears throat> Those are the elements of, of perfect competition. And then at the other end of the spectrum, what was on the monopoly side? Dawson? One seller. One seller, so no competition, basically one show in town. What else? Barriers to entry. Barriers to entry is the big one. And homogeneous goods, since it's only one seller, one product, then it's one, one thing that they're selling too. But the barriers to entry end up being a important elements. So we'll continue to kind of review those each time we, we enter into various elements of this. So right now we're still on the, the competitive environment um, where we left off yesterday. Uh, we were able to kind of noodle ourselves through uh, what we call the long run equilibrium. Long run equilibrium in perfect competition. So what we're saying is let's allow a long enough period of time for people to enter and exit. And what did we predict was going to happen with profits? That's kind of one of our key conclusions we come to in, an, in a competitive environment. What's true about economic profits? How much profit is the... Farmer Joe or the representative company that's operating in a perfectly competitive environment, what's their level of profits going to be? What would you predict in the long run or over a long period of time? Each of those drops of water in the bucket, what's their economic profit going to be? A little louder, I hear somebody say it maybe. The same? The same, yes, but I want something more specific. Zero, good justice, right? So they're gonna be, remember zero economic profit means you're still earning a profit, but it's a normal profit, right? The profitability of those companies is normal. It's not abnormally large. Um, it's also not losing money, but you're earning a normal profit in those industries because free entry and exit allows people, if you did have an abnormally high profit, people are gonna enter that market, and then the price is gonna fall, and it's going to eventually, in the long run, come back to zero. All right, so here is long run equilibrium. We're gonna just start with that concept today. Draw the two graphs side by side again. I like to draw the market to the left. For some reason, your textbook author reverses this, but it doesn't make sense to me. And so hopefully you won't find it confusing. It's no big deal. They just basically put this over here. And I guess you could kind of think that the, the companies feed into the market. But I like to think of the market 
price being determined externally from our company, and this is what we were used to in chapter three. So this is just home base in the market where there's some sort of starting price and some sort of equilibrium quantity. <clears throat> and so let's call this uh, uh, the market for soybeans. Since we used corn yesterday, I wanna make sure we're being distinct here. Let's say that corn, uh, soybeans are selling for $8 a bushel. And now we can tell some sort of uh, test problem like, you know, suppose soybeans are found to cure cancer or something stupid like that, right? Like those crazy questions that you guys got in the homework and tests. And then we would just go chapter three, we're like, oh, soybeans cure cancer. That would be an increase in demand, right? And so then we can move this around and make predictions on price and quantity. So the focus of this chapter is to kind of hone in, well, what does that mean for the profit maximizing business over here? So this is the representative firm. The representative firm in general is what we call it. So let's just say since we're soybean farmers here, this is Farmer Mac. So we got Farmer Mac, the soybean farmer, and this is his situation. He's a price taker because there's thousands of sellers, thousands of buyers. He's just a small fish in the big pond. And so he has to take the price that the market gives him, which means no matter how much corn he makes, uh, soybeans he makes, the demand for his soybeans is always at that price of eight, giving it a perfectly elastic demand curve. What was the marginal revenue then for Farmer Mac? What was the marginal revenue we learned yesterday from Farmer Mac? What's it equal to? Go back in your notes and look at what we did for Farmer Ted. Was it Farmer Ted? Tom? Joe. Who was it, Ted or Tom? Joe. Joe, Farmer Joe, okay. Farmer Joe yesterday. So in this case, for Farmer Mac, our soybean farmer, what would the marginal revenue be equal to? The revenue generated by an additional bushel of soybeans. Eight dollars, right? So every bushel of soybeans that Farmer Mac makes is going to generate revenue equal to the price. So in a competitive environment, the revenue generated by an additional unit is equal to the market price, which was $8 just using these numbers that I made up. OK, so then Farmer Mac cannot avoid the law of diminishing marginal product which gives rise to the law of increasing cost. And so we have a marginal cost curve. The cost of each additional bushel of soybeans looks like that. J-shaped intersects somewhere. <clears throat> and so then we learned that Farmer Mac will maximize profits by doing what? Let's see, Dawson, number between two and nine. Seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Kennedy, how does a firm maximize profits? It's in your notes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Jackson, were you here yesterday? Uh, I want to say Cole. All right. How does a firm maximize profits? You can look back in your notes. You were here yesterday, weren't you? Look back in your notes. How does a firm maximize profits? Everybody should be looking. Damien, how does a firm maximize profits? Oop, Emily's ready. Emily, how does a firm maximize profits? Excellent. Damien, how does a firm maximize profits? Emily, how does a firm maximize profits? Excellent. David, how does the firm maximize profits? Emily, how does the firm maximize profits? Do you want to just Yeah, I'm going to call the last Excellent. Cole, how does the firm maximize profits? Yeah. 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 
Excellent. Kennedy, how does the firm maximize profits? Excellent. Everybody together. By producing the quantity where the revenue generated by the last unit is just equal to the cost of the last unit. Holy grail of making profits, making money. This is what part of the economic way of thinking. This is part of what you can contribute to your business when you go to work for somebody. How does your, your boss, your owner, your mom, your dad, your what, they want to know how to make money. This is how you do it. Should I make a move? Well, wait a second. What's the cost of making that move? X. What's the revenue generated by making that move? Y. If Y is bigger than X, do it. If not, don't. Every move you make in your business throughout the business day, 8 a.m., 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 11 a.m., minute, noon, all through the workday, there's decisions being made, yes or no? Yes. Every decision, remember brushing your teeth? Every decision, apply that same analysis each time and you will be doing profitable things. You'll be doing profitable things for your company. We learned yesterday, you still might be losing money, but you'll be losing the least amount of money possible by following that principle. All right, so how does Farmer Mac maximize profits by producing the quantity this one right here where the revenue generated by the last unit eight dollars is just equal to the cost of the last unit go up to the marginal cost curve hang the left which was eight dollars so by producing this quantity farmer mac is maximizing profits or minimizing losses depending on where the average total cost curve is which is what we're going to get into next so the long run equilibrium and perfect competition would be uh, such that all firms are earning a normal profit. All right, so the, watch me place the, the average total cost curve. It's downward sloping, it's bowl shaped. It needs to always, by definition, cut through the marginal cost curve at its minimum point. So this sucker's gonna look like this average total cost. All three lines are going to intersect right at that minimum point. <clears throat> now we see profits are equal to zero under this set of circumstances because the average total cost of producing this profit maximizing quantity, let's just say it's 100 just to make up a number. So by producing 100 bushels of soybeans, the average total cost per unit, I go up to the average total cost curve, hang a left, read off that number, it's $8. The average total cost is $8, but look, the price is too. The price is $8. So the price of $8 minus the average total cost of $8, times the quantity gives me 8 minus 8 equals 0 times the 100 equals Zippo. So in the long run, because of free entry and exit and identical products, we would predict economic profits equal to 0. So long run prediction. Long run prediction in a competitive market. Long run prediction and perfect competition. Economic profits, this is a good test question, equals zero due to free entry and exit of firms. People's ability to compete with you is going to drive profits to being normal. So remember, recall, firm 
earns a normal profit when economic profit is zero. So companies are still making money, they're just earning a normal amount of money given the amount of risk and resources that are put into the production of the good. <clears throat> okay, questions or comments there? Yeah. Let's say like we talked about it cures cancer. Yeah. What would change on that graph? Would it be the marginal cost or the marginal revenue? Excellent question. You basically just teed me up beautifully for what we're going to do next. Um, so we're going to do a change now. So I'll, I'll have you hold that thought and see if we tackle that here next. Any other questions? All right, I'm gonna explain that as Dawson put it. So he was wondering what changes if there was a cure for cancer. So the way we're gonna do it, it's a, there's, there's actually three cases. So we're gonna tackle the first case. So let's call this changes, changes to long run equilibrium in a constant cost industry. So this constant cost industry, I'll define later, but I want to make sure that's on the title. So now let's go ahead and let's leave that one good in your notes so that you guys know what a long run equilibrium looks like. Let's go back and redraw. Redraw basically the same thing. We can uh, supply, demand, we'll start off at $8 with P1 equal to $8, price, quantity. So we're still talking soybeans. We got the representative firm over here, maybe Farmer Mac. Farmer Mac has a perfectly elastic demand curve, which is equal to marginal revenue curve, some sort of marginal cost, and uh, average total cost curve. Call little q at q1, quantity of soybeans. Just totally redrawing what we did over there. I just didn't want to mess up that one so that you guys had that good one in your notes. <clears throat> okay, so while you get caught up there. So let's go ahead with the soybeans uh, cure cancer concept, since I brought up something ridiculous, but it could be anything. You're good, Chris. Could be anything, but we want the demand to shift. So something makes soybeans, maybe we learn how to make fuel from soybeans, kind of similar to cars, but whatever. So there's an increase in demand for soybeans. Let's just go with the cure cancer thing. So that shifts up the demand curve from D1 to D2. There's an increase in demand. Okay, so now we did this a little bit yesterday when we were wa walking through the, the model, uh, except we had a loss at that point. But what happens to the price of soybeans when, they, when it's found out that they can do a little cancer curing for us? It goes up, okay. So our chapter, chapter three stuff says that the price is going to go up. So if we start at, let's call it point A, in the short run, we're going to move to point B here, which gives us a $10, let's call it P2 equals $10 for soybeans. Now notice that soybean producers produce more, right? So the quantity supplied by all soybean producers goes up to Q2. So there's a bump up in production when we have the higher price by all soybean producers. All right, so what about Farmer Mac over here? So here's Farmer Mac again. How does Farmer Mac respond to the new $10 price increase, or the increase in price to $10? Produces more. All right, so what graphically would go on here? 
how would you reflect those changes on this graph? Go further up the J. Further up on this marginal pass curve, right? So what happens to this curve? It goes up, right? So now there's just a higher price. So at $10, the new marginal revenue curve, D, let's call it uh, D2 equals MR2. Basically, this thing shifts up by that $10 amount. And now, how does Farmer Mac maximize profits? Same way as before, but now we have a new marginal revenue. By producing the quantity where the revenue generated by the last bushel of soybeans equals the cost of the last bushel of soybeans. And so Farmer Mac's going to bump up production from Q1 to Q2. All right. Does Farmer Mac enjoy this change with soybeans? Has it been profitable for him? Yeah, right? So now we can calculate the profits, uh, which I still have here as the difference between now the new price and the average total cost. And so at a price of $10, the average total cost of producing Q2, I go up to the average total cost curve, hang a left, and read off that number, which, let's see, we were at eight here, we're not quite nine, so it looks like $8.70 for me. $8.70, just making up a number. But if you had better information, like you guys might on your homework or test problem, you'd have to kind of give the exact number maybe. So bear that in mind. And so now the price is $10, and the co average total cost is $8.70. So if we go back to the, uh, the other way of writing it, I want to show you guys another way to think about it. Total revenue minus total cost, remember, is what we had there, where this is price times quantity minus average total cost times quantity. So now check it out. Watch this. This rectangle right here, the area of that rectangle is a height of 10, a base of Q2, let me just put a number on Q2. Let's just say it's 120 from 100. So we got 120 times 10 gives you that area. The average total cost is 870 of producing 120 units. That's that rectangle. That rectangle represents total cost. So graphically, total revenue minus total cost gives you this leftover region. Right here. And that is the amount of economic profit. You can also think of this as being 10 minus 870 is what? A buck 30. A buck 30 of profit per unit times the 120 units gives you that rectangle. So either way you cut it, that rectangle that's shaded in orange is the amount of economic profit. Okay, so unfortunately Dawson's gone to see the full answer to his question at this point, but uh, he had to get to his baseball game. Um, questions on that? All right, so now the light switched on. Get out. Get out. Economic profit, what's the signal going out? Get out. Sell. Sell, get out. Does it, do you want to leave when you're making lots of money? This is positive economic profit. So remember, this is good. Farmer Mac is enjoying this, so it's good for him. But what's the signal being sent out to the rest of the entrepreneurs around the world? What commodity is hot right now? Soybeans. Soybeans. Enter. 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 So what happens when other farmers or entrepreneurs, 
they see abnormally high profits in the soybean market and they choose to enter because of the profitability not only of Farmer Mac, remember, but the thousands of farmers. This is just Farmer Mac's a drop of water is just the representative firm, which means all of the farmers are earning big buco bucks. So once they enter, what happens? Price drops. We're kind of back to this side of the equation. And so now we start to see entry of firms. And if you memorized your demand and supply shifters, all of this stuff kind of builds on itself a little bit. As we enter, the number of firms goes up, the supply shifts to the right. And that's going to be your price starting to fall. When does it stop? Somebody stop me, please. When does the entry of firms stop? Isn't it whenever you make the same money? That when you're making the same money, what money? The eight dollars. Okay, back to the price of eight, which in which economic profit is zero. Back to zero. Then, so basically, anytime there's an orange rectangle here, anytime there's an orange rectangle, the enter sign is still on, right? It's still above normal profits. So they're going to continue to enter and drive down the price, and then the orange box is going to start to shrink. And when the orange box disappears, boom, the light switches off, right? It's like enter, 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 enter. Whoop. No more profits being made. I don't have any reason to enter the soybean market. I can put my money in some other business and earn just as much. There's no additional incentive to enter soybeans anymore unless the enter sign clicks on again as something else changes in the market. Okay, questions or comments so far? All right, so let's write this down. This is, there's some steps going on. We just covered actually a lot of ground there on the dynamics, which is kind of fully answering what Dawson's question was to begin with. Okay, so changes long run equilibrium. So steps or long run changes. Step number one, we start with a long run equilibrium which means economic profits are zero. Number two, we had an increase in demand, a demand shock, which we showed as an increase in demand due to uh, soybeans curing cancer. So number three, that demand shock led to, so the increase in demand led to an increase in equilibrium price. The price went up, so did the quantity, and so did the quantity for the each representative firm. So I'm gonna put little big Q and little Q, we had both going on, Farmer Mac, and the market, so every farmer was bumping up production. And then number four, the increase in price led to economic profits greater than zero, our orange box. Okay, so this part of the story, steps one through four, reflect the short run situation. This is how 
the market responds in the short run. What was the distinction between the short run and the long run? Flip back into your notes. Short run versus long run. So this is the, right now this is basically the short run effect is one through four. So note one through four is the short run analysis or the short run effect. What was the distinction between the short run and the long run? So, Caleb? Short run is a period of time in which at least one resource is fixed. Okay, good. Long run is a period of time in which all resources can vary. All right, so in the short run, what this is saying is that all the existing farmers, given their current resources, uh, but at least one being fixed, they were all able to bump up production a little bit, right? They were all able to do it. But to have a brand new entrepreneur, a brand new farmer actually enter the market, they need all the resources, right? Land, tractor, basically all of the resources need to vary. And that's what puts us into this long run scenario next, where we start talking about the entry of firms. So this part so far was the existing farmers bumping up their production. And now the next thing with the profit signal on for enter, we're going to have us move to step number five. So step number five, economic profit greater than zero signals enter, which is an increase in supply. So we have entry of new firms because of the profit signal going on. So number six, the increase in supply leads to a decrease in price, which ultimately leads to a decrease in economic profit. And then where do we end? We end with step number seven. Uh, entry of new firms continues until economic profit equals zero, which is our new long run equilibrium. Okay, so let's add the long run part to our graph. Right now I left you with steps one through four, just the short run effect. And so now we can kind of, I hate to use the word cheat, but we can somewhat cheat a little because we know where that supply curve is going to go. It was going to go as Justice brought up, I think, here back to $8, right? So we know that this thing's going to move, this sucker's coming down. Notice as this comes down, what is each of the existing firms operating in the market as, the, as this starts to come down, what are they, what's happening to their quantity? Decreasing. It's decreasing, right? Because now if we were here, marginal revenue equals marginal cost here. So it's like we, we started here, we went up to Q2, but now as it starts to fall, we're gonna go down. Where are we gonna end? Right back where we started. So we're gonna end right back where we started. So on this graph, we can kind of cheat a little because we know that this new supply curve is gonna end right here at S2. And so the final resting place in our market is where the new demand curve with the cancer curing effects of soybeans and the new supply curve, the old firms plus the new ones that entered in, we're going to end up at Q3. And each of the existing firms now, 
we can label this back Q1 of 100 now equals Q3, which is 100, just using the number that I did. But we go back to each of the existing firms <coughs> making that amount. Okay, so um, challenge question for you. First of all, any questions for that last cleanup there? Challenge question for you. If this is measured in millions, and this is 100. How many companies are there in the whole market? If the representative firm is MAC here, and this is the market, how many companies are there? So remember, this number here is 100 million. This number here is just 100, 100 bushels of corn. I got my extra credit clip pen, Janiah's ready. A million. A million! Ding, 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 ding. Very good, Janiah. And what's your last name again? Hendrix. Excellent work. How'd you get that? Good. 100 million divided by 100. Right? I kind of kept the numbers so that they lined up pretty easy. But each firm on average is making, the representative firm is making 100 units. There's 100 million in the market, which means each one of these people, which would have been a million of them, were making the 100, 100 times 100 million. All right, so that is a little extra note here to put on. So note, the market supply Big Q is equal to the sum of all the suppliers Q. So if we were to put a math to this, it would be the first company plus the second company plus the third company plus the nth company. We're just adding up the 100 million equals 100 plus 100 plus 100 plus 100 plus 100. When all suppliers are assumed identical, that implies that big Q is equal to little Q times the number of firms. So where Janiah got her answer from, very astutely, was from our example here, we had big Q of 100 million. I'm just trying to decide if I should put all the zeros or not. I think I'm just going to put 100 million equals Q, which was 100 times N which means n equals 100 million over 100 equals 1 million. Now, Janaya might have did that all in her head, just kind of looking at the numbers, but this is kind of laying everything out, right? So there's 1 million firms is the number of firms. All right, so you'll see that possibly come up a little bit too 
of the relationship between this graph and this graph, just bear in mind that the little q, there's a relationship here with the quantities in the, in the market versus the quantity for the representative firm. Okay. All right, so that was a constant cost industry. Um, we'll do, we're not gonna go through the detail that we just did for the other two cases. But the other two cases is an increasing cost industry and a decreasing cost industry. Let me give you the feel for the story for the increasing cost. As the uh, entry happens here and the market expands, there's more people wanting to buy the resources needed to make soybeans. And in doing so, it bids up the prices of those resources to make soybeans, right? The market's getting bigger, and so now there's more people wanting to buy the resources necessary to make soybeans. And in doing so, the cost of production start to creep up. So remember we did the shift of cost with the shift of the cost moving up? So that's what an increasing cost industry. What that means is that when this starts to move this way, this starts to drift up and they meet in the middle somewhere. And so now we get a different relationship with the long run supply curve, which I haven't drawn yet. In a decreasing cost industry, there's some benefits going on. So imagine, um, oh, I like to use, I don't even know if it's true, but it seems like a good story. Um, <laughs> when the automobile industry started in its infancy, in the 1920s and we need tires Henry Ford needed to make tires for the automobile he starts mass producing automobiles and figures out we need a lot of tires we've never had to make this many tires rubber tires before and so they're able to make a large manufacturing plant to make tires and in doing so the cost per unit of every tire starts to fall that was our concept of economies of scale as I increase the scale of production, as tire production grows massively, it's possible that the cost of tires on average would fall because of mass production. And so that would be a possibility of a decreasing cost industry. In other words, as this industry expands, the average cost per unit could actually fall a little bit. And that would cause us to uh, have the supply movement be even further and come down to a lower long run price than where we started with. So those are the three cases. Uh, your textbook does a good job of kind of outlining that. I'm going to make some notes here that hopefully you can connect it back to the constant cost industry. And then we'll move on to our uh, next topic. Okay, so um, so the other cases here. So let's see. Three. Let, let me kind of summarize the other one too. So three cases of long run changes to equilibrium. So number one is what we just did: the constant cost and. What that means is that the uh, supply curve is going to be kind of flat. So in the long run, price stays constant because average total cost stays constant as you move towards economic profits of zero. So we see a pretty stable price here of $8 was the story that we told. And the one thing I wanna add on is, uh, and again, your, your textbook will show this too, um, you can generate a long run supply curve now we did do a little bit of this with time with supply as we allowed more time for people to adjust did that make the supply curve flatter or steeper 
Was it more elastic or less elastic as we allowed people more time to adjust? Same thing was true with demand. So more time meant flatter curves or steeper curves? More time. Flatter. Because you can adjust your behavior more looking for substitutes and other things. And so here, if you think about, we started, I never put a point C here, by the way, so kind of A, B, C. A to B was our short run effect. B to C was our long run effect. So if we just map out the long run only, we started at A, we ended at C. And in fact, if the demand curve would have been here, we would have ended here. If the demand curve would have fallen, by the way, so let's say instead of soybeans or curing cancer, how about it causes cancer? So now, what happens if this happens? Soybeans cause cancer. What happens to the price of soybeans? It goes down. Now, you guys should hopefully get the gist, the, the groove of this. Price goes down. What happens over here to farmer Mac? What's happening with profits? It's going down big time. In fact, it's a loss. It's negative. What signal's coming on now? Exit. Exit. Whoops. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Somebody was on there. Noah, are you still there? Or did I just cancel cancel culture you out of there? Oh, I did. <laughs> Sorry. Now where the heck did that go? <clears throat> oh no, are you still there? You're still there, Noah. Thumbs up? You can hear me? Okay. Thought I lost you. I put my golf club down on my keyboard and, and it zipped out on me. All right, so I've got the exit signal on. What happens to supply with the exit signal? It goes, it goes the opposite direction. Now check it out, I wish I had my other golf club here. So soybeans cause cancer, boom, price falls. Existing companies leave. When do they quit leaving? When the profit signal turns off. So you get the same adjustment in the opposite direction, which is what we did yesterday when we first introduce some of the dynamics here of competition. And so ultimately, you always come back, whether it would be a decrease or an increase, to this price of eight, which is what our conclusion was there. And so if we connect these long run dots, the long run supply curve looks like that at eight. So in a constant cost industry, the long run supply is flat. Okay, so increasing cost industry, case number two. Increasing cost industry. So the kind of the key point I'll lead off with that is that as supply increases, basically entry, the market's expanding, the average cost, the average cost of production, the average total cost curve increases. It shifts up. So you can think of the existing firms are competing for resources and for whatever reason it causes cost to go up. So that's the increasing cost industry. And so we'll, what that means is that in the long run, price will increase when economic profits get back to zero. So in that case, graphically, This sucker's going up while this sucker's coming down, and so we're gonna meet somewhere in the middle. And so our ending place is gonna be somewhere over here. 
which is going to cause the price to be a little bit higher. Okay, questions or comments on that? Yeah, Jay? So what happens if uh, Farmer Mac discovers a new strand of, of it that does, that actually does double up the last word? So like, okay, uh, so if Farmer Mac discovers basically a new technology that makes yeah, it cheaper? Yeah, that makes it a whole lot else, but, it, but, but he's still going, but he's like in the hole, I guess. But he's still, like, he's still out. So, out. individually, Farmer Max would drop, okay. and he might be making profit. But if he doesn't have any property rights protection, then all the other farmers are going to copy. And if they all copy him, then everything's going to be copied. So, really, what you're setting up is is the next, the last case we'll cover is a decreasing cost industry. It's possible that prices fall over time as well. So let's do that, and then we'll kind of open it up for more questions if you have them. So a decreasing cost industry. The key point to it that an increase in supply leads to a decrease in average total cost. You can kind of think of this as being economies of scale. So I did my little example of uh, economies of scale. Um, automobiles, autos, and tires with Henry Ford and the Ford automobile and mass production. So if costs are falling, or like Jay said, as uh, there might be new innovations that come in the soybean market, whether it was Farmer Mac who developed it or somebody else, and that causes uh, costs to fall as the industry grows, we have a decreasing cost industry. So in the long run, price will decrease. as long run equilibrium as long run equilibrium is restored with step number seven here economic profits equal zero Okay, so hopefully all of this starts to bolster your competence in capitalism. You're going to hear people, politicians, friends, family members say the problem with the United States is capitalism. The market system is bad. It breeds greed. It breeds consumerism. And I hope that your takeaway from principles of econ class is that not if it's missing competition. Not if the government's not protecting one particular business, right? That croniest idea. But if there's free entry and exit, and people are able to compete with the existing businesses, this is our prediction. Existing businesses are gonna earn a fair profit, a normal profit. Because if it is abnormal, the signal's on. The signal's on, and when the signal's on, the result is, the profits disappear. When the signal's on, the profits disappear. And so it's real important. Another lesson that comes about that you might have heard of is kind of a first mover advantage. Um, it kind of plays into what Jay was bringing up. If you come up with a new technology or a new innovation, um, you better grab onto all the money you can at the time you do it because before other people figure it out and before you have competition, you need to grab onto that uh, action as quickly as you can because eventually it'll be either replicated or they'll be not necessarily like have you heard of patents that people have but they come up with something that's close but it's legally different from the patent but it ends up providing a good substitute for the patented item that happens too right so eventually those things go away and so you better uh, 
the old cliche is make hay while the sun shines. Have you guys heard that cliche before? Make hay while the sun shines. So those of you who have a little bit of farming background, uh, do you want to bale hay when it's wet? No, what happens if you bale hay when it's wet? It molds from the inside. You basically make a nice little compost pile uh, by baling up hay. So when you're making hay while the sun shines, the sun doesn't always shining. So when it does, take advantage of it and, and uh, get, your, get your hay made. Yeah, so once, Let's say he does that, right? He creates a new technology and he, I wouldn't say like he, I guess he patents it. Yeah. Could now, would that be a, a new type of like profit? Because now he can like, now he can charge farmers. If they want to use that strength, they can just charge them. Yeah, he yeah. He, the farmers, basically if a, a person came up with a new technology, a new fertilizer, a new whatever you want to call it, something related to soybean production, then, um, and that, Basically, by the farmer using the new technology, it drops it by a dollar per bushel. Then that means the person who owns that technology could, in theory, charge up to a dollar. But certainly, if he charged <coughs> 80 cents, the farmer would still be ahead, you would be ahead, a win-win situation, right? So that's the market in action. That's exactly uh, the entrepreneurship, the entrepreneurial activity that we want to have people to have incentive to do to innovate and to change, and ultimately, that's gonna make prices lower for all people who are buying soybeans, wherever that might be, which might be for your, um, for your miso soup in Japan with uh, eating your tofu, uh, you have cheaper tofu now to eat, unrelated by somebody coming up with some whiz-bang idea on making soybean farming more efficient and more effective. Okay, good, anything else there? All right, great. So, um, we spent so much time on that, I just hate to erase it, so let me erase this first. So, the next topic I wanna look into is, when do we find it right to shut down? When does it not make sense to produce any more today? Um, what are the hours at Price Chopper here in Ottawa, roughly? When does it when does it close down? Anybody know? You guys probably, especially college students, make late runs to grocery stores. Ten. I think it's ten. Yeah. Uh, you know, during COVID, of course, it changed a little bit, but so ten o'clock. And so the question is, why isn't Price Chopper open twenty four seven? Are there some grocery stores that are open twenty four seven? But not this one. Why? Workers a lot more than on like overnight shifts. Okay, so they got some workers, some other expenses. Ben? Don't make as much money in those hours. Don't make as much money during those hours. In fact, they don't make enough money to make it profitable to stay open during those hours. Now, would some college student, you know, maybe a drunk college student, hopefully somebody else drove them, want to get some munchies for some chicken wings or something at 12.30 at night? And those chicken wings are you know, whatever, $7. So would they potentially make a sale at 1230? Absolutely, right? So there's potential revenue at 1230 at night after midnight, but you're only making seven bucks. How much did I pay that cashier to be man uh, manning the, the cash register? 10 probably in today's market anyway. One hour was 10 bucks. So now we're already thinking, in order for Price Chopper to stay open, if we can get away with just a couple people on staff and we're, pay we're able to pay those people $20 an hour, how much product do I need to be selling at least for just taking into account those two employees? 20 bucks. I have to reasonably expect that I'm going to sell at least $20 worth of product to even justify two employees being on staff during that time, right? So we're now getting back into thinking about the variable cost of production versus the fixed cost of production and how much the variable revenues essentially would be during certain times. So all of this is when is it proper to shut down? So we call it the shutdown point. So when is the right time 
to shut down. So now I want to be clear, when we use the word shut down in this class, we're not going out of business. So a shutdown means produce quantity equal to zero, which is again probably a weird way economists would be looking at. Shutdown means to produce quantity equal to zero. For example, I think let's just motivate with what we just did. If two employees at the grocery store cost $20 per hour, which I'm saying 10 each, if two employees at the grocery store cost $20 an hour, then they need to sell at least $20 of food to justify staying open. This probably won't happen at midnight in Ottawa, Kansas. Maybe we better be specific because maybe downtown Kansas City might be different. In Ottawa. So, shut down. Shut down and reopen at 7 a.m. I think that's when they open. Maybe it's even 6 a.m. But whenever, they're going to reopen when it starts to make sense that they're covering those costs. Yes, Justice? Um, so with like the shortages of like workers and stuff, okay. how does that affect? Like, would that be a loss still? Yeah, good question. So the question is, uh, what, what about with the shortages of workers, kind of like what we're experiencing right now where it's hard to find work? Um, so yeah, if we, um, let's say we can't provide the, the high level of service that we normally expect, right? That there's, uh, uh, the, the shelves aren't being stocked or something. And so uh, that could start to deter people from wanting to go there, right? They're like, oh, this place never has the food I want because there's not enough people stocking the shelves. And so that's kind of a little bit longer run adjustment. And so to, to accommodate that, the store might need to say, maybe we should try $15 an hour, right? If they feel like it's costing them sales, then they might need to raise the wage, which is going to raise the cost, right? And then we're kind of back to analyzing the, the rest of the cost. But it's still justified at that point, as long as the additional costs are less than the additional uh, people. Now, um, uh, I think that's a good point. Um, what have we seen during COVID when they can't find enough help? Especially as we unlock down, what, what are restaurants doing that was different pre-COVID? Emily? They close early. So now instead of closing at uh, t I guess I didn't write it down, but instead of closing at 10 p.m., we're only open till 8 or something, right, or 9. So, and again, it comes down to this shutdown decision. Now it's because I can't even find people to make that minimum level of service possible. So that would be one reaction to it. What else did they do? Carry out. Carry out. So focus more on just carry out only. So we're still open till 10, that's the good news, but the dining room closes at 7 or 6 or whatever, right? Pick a number. So they might have did those variances. How many of you have gone to a restaurant thinking it was going to be open and it was closed because of COVID? So now we're used to be open Monday, seven days a week, and now we're closed Monday, Tuesday, right? And so we've actually shut down. Same concept though, we're shutting down on certain days of the week because it economically didn't make sense uh, given our variable cost and, and revenues that we expected. Good, any other questions or comments? 
how about a like self checkout by like, going to like stores like that have an uh, event? Yeah, I just funny funny that you said that. I just saw a joke come around that uh, a new it wasn't really a joke, but a observation they had uh, a new I think it was a grocery store opened up. Yeah, it was a new Hy-Vee somewhere opened up, and they went to all self checkout. So no people. They went to all self checkout. And then the kind of the joke, I couldn't tell if it was a joke or reality, uh, half the lanes were closed. <laughs> so it's like, why, why am I waiting in line at the self-checkout when there's all self-checkout, but you know, they still have one person probably monitoring it. So it's kind of a half joke, half reality. But, um, and so you know, businesses are gonna continue to look for those labor saving techniques. So as now the, we have to bump up our pay from 10 to 15, they have all the more incentive to bite the bullet on that self-checkout line, which might be a $100,000 investment or something, right, or more. So some sort of uh, investment into computers and the systems that allow self-checkout, all of a sudden, oh, well, we're starting to pay 15 an hour. It used to not math out when I could get people to work for me for $10, but if it's 15, I start doing the math of having seven people, all of a sudden that investment pays for itself quicker. All right, so there would be more incentive to move into uh, non-labor ways of producing whatever I produce. Good. Anybody else? All right. So let's take a look at this shutdown decision. Um, let's motivate this with a little example. So suppose Jack Daniels Corporation. has the following cost structure. So those of you who don't know, Jack Daniels is kind of a famous bourbon maker. And they have total cost of $130,000. And that is broke down into total variable costs of $50,000 and total fixed costs of $80,000. Has anybody had a chance to visit uh, like the bourbon where they make it down on uh, the bourbon trail in Louisville, Kentucky area? My brother lives near there, so I went to the, the Jim Beam thing. And it was freaking awesome. I mean, they have warehouses. If you you could see them online too, but they have warehouses of barrels of bourbon, about you know the equivalent of a three four story building, just packed in as far as the eye can see. Like it, it's just crazy amounts that are being stored. And so they have a fairly high fixed cost. I'm just, I've just made up these numbers, but relatively speaking, with the land and the barrels and the amount of product that's sitting there, they probably have a fairly high fixed cost of production, right, to, to make their uh, bourbon. Okay, so um, if for Jack marginal revenue equals marginal cost at a quantity of 10,000 barrels. So we're imagining that they are at 10,000 barrels and they're maximizing profits. We can now calculate the average total cost, average variable cost and all of that. So the average total cost would be my 130,000 divided by my 10,000, which means each bottle of Jack is running me 13 bucks. And then you might remember from our equation that the sum of the averages equals the total, which means my average variable cost is the 50,000 divided by the 10,000 gives me the five bucks, and finally my average total cost, or average uh, fixed cost rather, my average fixed cost is the 80,000 divided by the 10,000 barrels gives me eight dollars. Eight plus five is 13, that's just the breakdown of the averages. All right, so, um, Let's assume that Jack Daniels prices, the bourbon market falls through. 
awful day for Jack. So let's assume the price, the market price of bourbon falls. Maybe it's causing cancer or something they learn. So there's still some alcoholics that are willing to pull it, pour it down their throat, but the casual drinker says, no way. So what is Jack's profit? So put, do your profit equation here. What's Jack's profit? If we have 10,000 bottles, a price of four, average total cost, what is profit? What's the general equation for profit? Total, total revenue, revenue minus, minus total, total cost. cost. Good. So always be able to do that part. That'll get you partial credit, at least on a test question. Being able to write that down. So total revenue minus total cost. We've got price times quantity. And we've got average total cost. So we could also look at it as this way. I've been using little q here, so I'll try to be consistent. Little q. So what's Jack's profit? Jensen. Negative 90,000. Negative 90,000, right? So it's 4 minus my average total cost of 13 times my 10,000 units. 4 minus 13 equals a negative 9, so it's negative 90,000 bucks. So that was our situation when we did the marginal revenue equal marginal cost. Now, as we look at this information, is there a better option for Jack than producing 10,000 and losing 90 grand? Is there a better option? Produce less. Produce less, how much less? All of it. No, you're right. If that's what you said, you said all of it, right? What is Jack's profit at zero? No, not zero. Still got to pay the rent. Still got to pay what? Even if we don't pump out any bottles this year, total fixed cost, total fixed cost right? So how much did I lose? 80,000. 80, what would Jack rather do, lose 80 or lose 90? 80. 80. That's the shutdown question. We need to at least cover those variable costs. We need to at least pay our people as we're making it. Otherwise, it might be better to shut down. So. Note, at a quantity equal to zero, which is the shutdown point, at shutdown, profits equal total revenue of zero minus total cost, which is now equal to our negative of our total fixed cost, which equals negative A. All right, we'll pick up there on Thursday.